Well, thank you, choir, praise team, and instrumentalists for leading us this morning. At this time, we'll dismiss our children on the Children's Church. I want to invite all of our kids to meet Miss Nikki back there in the foyer and enjoy a time of studying God's Word at Children's Church. For those of you that are going to be sticking around in the sanctuary, this morning I'd like to invite you, if you have your Bible, to turn to the Gospel according to John. We'll be looking at three different chapters in John's Gospel, beginning with the first chapter, John chapter 1. We've been going through a sermon series entitled, Who's Your One? We began this series last week where we've been asking the question, who is the one person that God has put in our path that he's called us to be a witness to? Who's that one person that God has, has uh, placed in our path that we can share the gospel with, that we can invite to church, that we can in- in- encourage them to encounter Jesus Christ and have their life changed? Last week, we looked at the story of the paralytic man who had four friends that were determined to get him to Jesus. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that when they couldn't get through the door, they went through the roof in order to get their friend to Jesus because they knew that their friend needed an encounter with Jesus Christ. He needed his life changed by Christ. And so this morning, we're asking kind of that same question, who is your one? Last week, I gave you a card. Uh, it looks like this. I also gave you a prayer guide. Uh, in that prayer guide, in that card, I encourage you to be thinking and praying about uh, who that one person is uh, in your life. At the end of the service this, uh, this morning, we're going to take these cards and we're going to put the name of that person that God has put in our path, the name of that person that God has put in our heart, and we're going to put it on this board as kind of a, an act of commitment, an act of accountability to one another to be able to say, this is the person that God has called me to be a witness to, and I'm asking my church family to come together and help me to do uh, that, to be a witness to that one. This morning, as we continue on this, this idea of who's your one, I want to introduce you to a disciple named Andrew. Now, I know if you've read the Bible, many of you are familiar with Andrew. You're probably familiar with the one most important detail of Andrew's life, and that is he is the brother of Simon Peter. As a matter of fact, I think every time he is introduced in the Scriptures, 12 times his name is used, I think almost every time it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. That's how he's known. That's how he's well known. Uh, And that is probably his call to fame. But did you know that without Andrew, there would be no Simon Peter, the apostle of Christ? Without Andrew, Simon Peter would have never encountered Jesus Christ. Simon Peter would have never had his life changed. Simon Peter would have never been there in Caesarea Philippi when Jesus looked at Simon Peter and said, you are uh, Peter, and upon this rock, upon that confession of faith that you've just made, I will build my church. Without Andrew... There really is no Simon Peter, the apostle. We pick up the story in John chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 35. John is introducing Jesus to us. He's uh, just told us that John the Baptist has proclaimed that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And we pick up the story in verse 35 of chapter 1. And it says this. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, What are you seeking? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came, and they saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. We see here Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, bringing Simon Peter to Jesus. But Simon Peter's not the only one that Andrew brought to Jesus. Let's jump now several chapters over to chapter 12. And in chapter, or sorry, chapter 6. And in chapter 6 we see Jesus is is teaching 5,000, at least more than 5,000 the Bible says. Jesus is teaching them and it's lunchtime. And the question is, what are we going to do with all of these people? How are we going to feed them? Well, we pick up the story beginning in verse 1 of John chapter 6. It says, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because he saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain 
And there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Andrew not only brought Simon Peter to Jesus to have Peter's life changed, Andrew now brings this small boy who has the lunch that perhaps his mother had packed him that day, these Five loaves, five small loaves, and these two fishes. The the Greek word implies that they're little bitty fish, like sardine-type fish. And he brings this boy to Jesus, and he says, here, Jesus, is this boy. He's got some bread, and he's got some fish. He doesn't have much else. What can we do with this? We see Simon Peter, or we see Andrew again, Simon Peter's brother, in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, we have a great theological question. There are some Gentiles, some Greeks, that want to have a conversation with Jesus. They want to have an encounter with Jesus. And so these Greeks go to Philip, one of Jesus' disciples, and they say to Philip, Hey, Philip, we want to see Jesus. And Philip has no idea what to do because Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Philip didn't understand that Jesus came for the sins of the whole world. He's trying to figure all this stuff out. And so what does Philip do? Well, let's find out. It says in verse 20 of John chapter 12, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who, were, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. We see here in John chapter 12 again, Andrew being instrumental in bringing people to Jesus. As a matter of fact, that's probably, apart from being Simon Peter's brother, that's probably the most characterizing trait of Andrew is that he's always mentioned in the fourth gospel, in John's gospel, as bringing people to Jesus. That's what he did. What a great testimony for somebody to have that about them, to where they're known, if you want to get to Jesus, go talk to Andrew. He will get you to Jesus. He will be the one to tell you about Jesus. He'll be the one to introduce you to Jesus. We see this in Andrew's life. And I, I want you to understand something about Andrew. It, it, it is his, his whole life is centered around this. Andrew, the word Andrew comes from the Greek word andros, which is where we get our word man from. Literally, his name means manly. And I I think about how ironic this is because we live in a day and time nowadays where it seems like if you want to be manly, you've got to be tough and strong. And and really, nobody thinks of a tough man as being spiritual. Nobody thinks of a tough man as being real involved in church. But Andrew teaches us if you want to be manly, you need to be somebody who's bringing people to Jesus. Jesus. So this morning, what I want to do, looking at the story of Andrew, I want us to look at some traits that Andrew had that I hope will be characteristic of us as well. And I want you to see, be thinking anyway, of who that one person is that God wants you to be Andrew for. Who's that one person that God wants you to bring to Jesus? The first thing I notice about Andrew is that Andrew had a personal encounter with Jesus. Before you can ever bring somebody else to Jesus, you've got to know him yourself. You've got to have that personal encounter. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 that Andrew was one of John the Baptist's disciples. It tells us in verse 35, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as Jesus walked by, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And these two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. It tells us that they spent time with Jesus. Andrew had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, and his life would never be the same. This morning, we're going to talk a lot about bringing your one to Christ. We're going to talk a lot about about how God wants to use you to be a witness for Christ. But I want to be clear, you cannot be a witness for Christ unless you yourself have had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. 
I'm not saying, have you ever been to church and heard somebody talk about it? Has Jesus changed your life? I mean, here is Andrew. He's been a follower of John the Baptist. He likes the things John the Baptist is teaching. Likely, Andrew has been baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. But when he sees Jesus and he hears the proclamation from John that this is the Lamb of God, Andrew says, if he's the Lamb of God, then I don't need to be following John. I need to be following Jesus. And he begins to go and follow Jesus. He he begins to continue to follow Jesus. And he spends time with Jesus. And he says, we want to know who you are. We want to know where you're staying, verse 38. It says in verse 39, and he said to them, come and you will see. And so they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. In other words, they spent all day with Jesus. His life was never the same. Some of you this morning have been in church for a really long time, and you've heard a lot of people talk about Jesus, but you've never had your life changed by Jesus Christ. At the end of the service, I'm going to be standing down front, and I would love to talk to you about how your life can be changed by Jesus Christ. You can have an encounter with Jesus that will change who you are for the better. If we want to be a witness for Christ, we've got to experience Christ ourselves. I didn't grow up going to church, but when I started going to church at age 15, I began to hear them talk a lot about Jesus, and I began thinking, well, yeah, this is a cool guy. Maybe I'll believe in Jesus. Maybe I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll call myself a Christian. But it wasn't until April of 1994 that I walked down the steps at Fort Walton Beach High School Stadium. It was their practice field at the time. And I talked to somebody, a guy named Rich Mayfield. I said, I need to have my life changed by Jesus Christ. And that night I prayed that Jesus would forgive me of my sin. That night I asked Jesus to change my life. And my life has never been the same since. It wasn't because I went to the right church. It wasn't because uh, I was trying to be a good person. It was because I went to Jesus and said, Jesus, I need my life changed. I need to be changed by you, and Jesus changed my life. If that's you this morning, in just a little bit, I'll be standing down front. Come and talk to me. Come and say, I need my life changed by Jesus Christ. If we want to be a witness to one, we've got to understand it starts with a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Andrew spent time with Jesus, and his life was never the same. The second thing I notice, not only did Andrew have an encounter with Jesus, but Andrew also knew the importance of one. Andrew knew the importance of one. What's the first thing that Andrew does when he Here's Jesus as the Lamb of God. When he spends time with Jesus, when his life is changed by Jesus. It tells us in verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Verse 41, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. If you're the kind of person that underlines verses in your Bible or highlights verses, verse 41, I've got highlighted in my Bible because it reminds me that as soon as we have an encounter with Jesus, the next thing we do is tell others about him. It doesn't take us waiting until we're religious scholars, until we've got God all figured out. It doesn't take us uh, having all the answers. What it takes is us having an experience with Jesus and wanting others to have the same experience with Jesus. Andrew knew the value of one. He went to the one person that he knew needed to know about Jesus. He went to his brother, and he said to his brother, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ in verse 41. Then in verse 42, what did he do? He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Peter's life is changed because his brother brought him to Jesus. I wonder this morning, If you know the person that is responsible for bringing you to Jesus, would you raise your hand if you know the name of the person that's responsible for bringing you to Jesus? A bunch of hands across the room. You know the name. You know the person. That, for me, there were many people who helped model my life, but the person that is probably responsible for me coming to know Christ is a lady named Kelly Stanford, who was a a youth teacher at First Baptist Church of Fort Walton Beach. She's the person who invested in my life 
to make sure I understood the gospel. She's the person who invested in my life to tell me about Christ. I grew up in Fort Walton Beach. The, when I first went to Sunday school at First Baptist Fort Walton Beach, I, I grew up doing what every little boy does, playing softball, playing little league, doing all the different sports. And I remember going to Sunday school for the first time after I became a Christian. My first Sunday after I've, I'd, I'd made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, and I looked around the room in my Sunday school class, and there were all my friends that I went to high school with, people that I'd known from when I was small. I grew up in Fort Walton Beach. All the people that, that were in that room had grown up in Fort Walton Beach. We played Little League together. We played baseball together. I'd been to their birthday parties, and I remember thinking, as a matter of fact, I told them this. I said, guys... You know, the, Kelly was my Sunday school teacher, and she said, guys, Will's made a decision to follow Jesus, and they were all real happy for me. And I looked at them, and I said, guys, I'm 15 years old, and I've grown up with all of you, and none of y'all ever took the time to tell me about Jesus. I could have been saved a lot longer, a lot earlier, if you'd have just taken the time to tell me. Andrew didn't wait. Andrew said, hey, Simon, you need to meet this guy. He has changed my life, and he can change your life as well. Andrew knew the value of one. Andrew wasn't interested in bringing the masses to the Lord. Not that he was against it, but, but for him, it wasn't about how many. It wasn't about the masses. It was about, hey, there's one person in my life that I can get to Jesus. That's my brother Simon. I'm going to bring him. We go to chapter 6, and there's one person a little boy with a small lunch. There's one per person. Andrew didn't look at that boy's lunch and say, nope, we can't use that. Andrew looked at that little boy's lunch and he said, you know what? I'm going to bring this one to Jesus because God can do great things. Andrew knew the value, the importance of the one. The one person that God has put in your path, you are that person you're the Andrew to them, to share the good news, to encourage them, to build them up, to tell them how your life was changed. Andrew knew the value, the importance of one. He had an encounter with Jesus. He knew the importance of one. And then last, Andrew knew the value of insignificant gifts. Now, that's almost an oxymoron, insignificant gifts, because all gifts are significant. But nevertheless, we sometimes classify these gifts as insignificant or unimportant. Andrew knew the value of insignificant gifts. You look at chapter 6 in, first, in, in John's gospel, and in chapter 6, John brings this little boy to Jesus. He's got five loaves of bread, small little pieces of bread. He's got two little sardine-type fish, and he brings this to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, I've got a boy here. He's got these loaves of bread. He's got these fish. Again, it's probably from his lunchbox that his mama packed as, we, as he was uh, headed to school. Who knows? But Andrew makes a statement that I believe, just because I believe as, as John portrays Andrew, I believe Andrew was saying, kind of sarcastically, but what can we do with this? What is this compared to all of these people? I mean, they're staring at 5,000. At least the Bible says there's 5,000 men, not counting the women and children that are there. What can we do with this insignificant gift? Have you ever felt like that? You ever thought that what you brought to the table wasn't enough? That what the gifts that you had, the skills you had, weren't good enough? Has there ever been a time where you've said, you know, I, I really, the reason I've never told my friends about Jesus is because I don't know that I have all the right answers? Have you ever thought, I, what if they ask a question that I can't answer? Or, or what if they try to counter me? What if they want to argue science or theology or, or all of this? And have you ever thought, man, I just don't know enough. I don't have enough to do that. You see, the, the thing about Andrew is that Andrew didn't make excuses when the, when the gifts seemed small. He just gave those gifts over to Jesus and said, Jesus, this is what I've got. Could you use it? And what happened? Thousands were fed. So much so that there was basketfuls left when everybody had had enough to eat. We often devalue the gifts that God's given us and said, well, I'm not a preacher. I can't stand up and sing a solo. I'm, I'm not gifted in the choir. I can't play an instrument. I can't 
teach Sunday school, we look at our values and our, our, our gifts and we say, they're just not good enough to be used by God. Let me tell you, what God has gifted you with is exactly what he wanted you to have. It's exactly the gift he wants to use. You, he wants you to use that gift for his kingdom purposes. He's given you all the tools you need to be able to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Here's what you need to know when it comes to sharing the gospel with your one. First, have you had an encounter with Jesus? Has Jesus changed your life? If yes, then you know what? You've got the story that you need to tell. You go to your friend and you say, look, I wanna tell you about Jesus and how he's changed my life. Can I tell you my story about how my life is different because of Jesus Christ? And you let God do the rest. Andrew knew the value of what seemed like an insignificant gift. And he brought that gift to Jesus and he says, this is what we've got, Jesus. Would you use it? Would you bless it and use it? I know oftentimes we, we think we're not good enough, we don't know the right answers. What if people reject us? What if they say, we've got all kinds of excuses as the reason why we don't invite people to church, why we don't share the gospel with people, but none of those excuses are good enough. The reality is, is God has put people in your path that he wants you to share the gospel with. He wants you to be the catalyst for them having life change. Will you be an Andrew for them? Will you be that one person who says, I'd like to tell you about Jesus. I'd like to tell you how my life was changed. And I'd like to tell you how your life can be changed by Jesus as well. Last week I mentioned as, as we hand out these cards, there's a lot of different people that God has put in our path. Some of us, God has given us a family member. He's put that family member on our heart and said, I wanna use you to reach that family member. I mentioned to you when I was 15 years old, after I came to know Christ as Savior, God put a burden on my heart for my family. I was a a Christian uh, getting up on Sunday mornings. My mom, I couldn't drive yet, so my mom would drop me off at church and she would come back and pick me up, but I was the only one in my family that was going to church on Sunday mornings. When I was old enough to drive, I drove myself all the way to church and all the way back by myself. And God began to place a burden on me as a 15 and 16 year old student. Would you share the gospel with your family? Would you pray for them? And I asked God to let me be an example. Now, you know the hardest people to witness to are your family because they know you. They know you when you mess up. They know you when you're cranky and when you're grouchy and when you're not acting very Christian. But I prayed, God, would you help me to find some way to be a witness to my family? And one Sunday, my mom said, hey, Will, I'm gonna go to church with you. That one Sunday led to her saying, hey, Will, I wanna be baptized. And I remember walking my mom down the aisle as she gave her life to Jesus Christ. And I remember uh, being there in uh, in the baptistry area when she was baptized. Her life changed by the gospel. She still serves at First Baptist Church, Port Walton Beach. I remember my dad after having been diagnosed with cancer, finally making a decision to follow Jesus Christ. By this time, I was a pastor in Mississippi. And I remember my pastor calling me and saying, Will, I want you to come back to your home church. I want you to baptize your dad because he's given his life to Jesus Christ. I remember a phone call a few years after that of my brother who he and his whole family had given their life to Christ. I got to baptize all of them. You see, when we say, God, would you use me to be a witness God will be faithful to us and give us an opportunity to be a witness. There may be a family member that God has put in your path that he wants you to be a witness to. There may be a coworker. There may be someone in your path. Maybe they, they work at a cubicle next to you or a classroom next to you. Maybe they, they work uh, you know, somewhere in your sphere of influence and God has said to you, that person needs Jesus. And God is calling you to share the gospel with that coworker. And maybe somebody, maybe there's a a store that you shop at a lot and you've gotten to know the employees there. Maybe there's a restaurant that you eat at a lot and you've gotten to know the waitress there. Maybe that's the person that God has put in your path for you to share the gospel with. Let me just say, if you're trying to share the gospel with a waitress, it starts by tipping well. Do that. Don't be cheap. But be a witness to them. Share the good news with them. 
whoever it is that God has put in your path. I wonder this morning if you'll take by faith the opportunity to write their name down on a card and come down and put it on the board. Maybe because it's a public thing, you don't want to write their whole name. Maybe you just want to write their initials. Maybe just their first name. However you want to do that. I want you to take your card. If you have one, there's more on the, on the pew up here. I want to take your card. I want you to tear off the top portion. Write their name down. Take a moment. Come to the altar. Pray for that person. And then pin it on the board. Take the other part. Put their name up there and keep it in your Bible. And continue to be praying and saying, God, use me to be a witness for you. God, use me to have somebody's life changed by the gospel of Christ. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to pray. Then I'm going to come down and I'm going to put my one on the board. And I hope you'll follow. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather together this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to hear from you, not just to to be spoken to, but the opportunity to hear from you. God, it's my prayer that this morning you would put a burden on every single one of us here, a burden to share the gospel with one. May we be an Andrew to one, whether it be a coworker, a family member, a fellow student who sits next to us at lunch. God, whoever you've put in our path, may we be faithful to pray. May we be faithful to share. Lord, in in this time of invitation, God, my prayer is that if there's someone here that's not had an encounter with you, would, would, would today be the day where they say, I need Jesus in my life. I need my life changed by Jesus. I need to be forgiven of my sins. I need to know that he died uh, and rose from the grave to pay the price for my sin. God, it's my prayer in these next few moments, you would speak to us. You would challenge us. You would convict us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you don't have a card, I've got some on the pew up here. I encourage you to come. And grab one. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if there's a decision that you need to make for Christ, I'm going to be standing down front. Come and talk to me. Don't let today go by without knowing that you belong to Christ. Let's stand and sing together and respond accordingly.
now and remainder of this month, we're going to keep this board here. As the Lord lays on your heart, and we know many are out of town this week because of fall break for the schools, as, as, as they come back and worship alongside of us, uh, we'll be, I'll have opportunities to put more names. And then once this sermon series is over, we're going to move this into the foyer uh, so that everybody has an opportunity to continue to pray because the goal is, is that these names that are represented here, these initials or names or whatever we've got written, the goal is, is that these names will come off because they've given their life to Jesus Christ and they've made decisions to follow Jesus. And then new names will continue to be added as God puts people in our path to be a witness to. So I hope and pray that God would use you mightily this week. Before we dismiss, I want to mention a couple of announcements. Uh, a big one is that uh, next Sunday is our softball tournament. We had to, had to postpone our softball tournament because of uh, the rain. And uh, next Sunday, all of the, uh, I wouldn't call it trash talking because it's a church, right? We don't trash talk. But uh, all of the, uh, uh, the, the, the bickering and, and talking back and forth will finally come to an end where we'll see which team is going to win. Um, if you haven't signed up for, for softball and you want to play, if you just show up, we'll put you on a, the right team. That'll take place next Sunday uh, after worship. Now, immediately following the worship next Sunday, we do have an opportunity uh, to uh, support our, our mission trip in June. We've got a team that's going to be working with our missionaries in Central Asia. And so that team is, is uh, going to be hosting a fundraiser meal. It's going to be basically a taco bar. So f- immediately following the service next Sunday, you'll have an opportunity to participate in that taco bar. If you want to uh, sign up just so we can have a better head count, there's a sign-up sheet, I believe, on the table across in the Welcome Center counter. But uh, sign up. Let us know you're coming. Come and get some tacos. And then immediately after you eat some tacos, meet us out at Gatman Park, and we will go and have a wonderful time of, of softball. And the good news is, is it's hopefully not going to be near as hot as it would have been uh, back when we were planning on doing this. So uh, looking forward to a great time next week. Tonight, hope to see all of you back uh, for our Awana clubs. We, remember, Sunday nights are about our, our, the next generation, about our students and our children. So I want to encourage you to help out with Awana clubs or, or come and worship alongside of our students and come. All of that starts at 5.30. Timmy, have you got anything else we need to announce? Will you dismiss us on our benediction? Let's conclude today's service by reciting the Great Commission together. It'll be on the screen. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You're dismissed.